And let's take a quick look once again at what's in the root of our project. So ignoring this .idea folder, which is um, used by my IDE, we have our data services test and web project and the solution. The next thing that I'm going to add here is what's called a make file. So I'm going to use Vim. Feel free to use a tech, any text editor of your choice, but we're going to just uh, be sure that it's named make file with a capital M here. And if you're not familiar with make, it is a tool that's been around for uh, quite a while now, um, since the early seventies. It's essentially used to manage projects. So um, what we'll be using it for in our purposes here, for our purposes, is to run database migrations and update databases. And why would we want to make or use a make file for that? Why would we want to use the make uh, build tool for that? Uh, long story short, it's because the number of commands that we need to run to do that are pretty verbose. And so we can instead sort of wrap those longer commands in simple make uh, build commands and so um, save ourselves some trouble, if you will. All right, so our, our make file will look like this. We can have a comment at the top just called project variables. And what we can do is assign some variables here. Um, I won't get too much into make syntax other than to say that we can define um, a variable project name in this way. I'm just going to call it good books. And then I'm going to have this sort of uh, syntax where we have this sort of like phony directive and I'm going to say migrations and DB. And what this is doing is it's essentially saying, hey, when you run a make command, rather than look in the directory where you're calling make for subdirectories called migrations and DB, if you, if you use those commands, then just execute um, what I've defined below. So we're, below we're going to define something called migrations and here we're going to CD into goodbooks.data and then we're going to run our .NET commands that actually execute the database migrations. So we'll do .NET EF dash dash startup dash project and then that's one directory up here in goodbooks.web migrations add and then we can actually inject a variable here and I'm just going to call it mname and then cd up a directory Okay, so as you can see, that's pretty verbose. Those are the steps that we would take when we run a database migration. Um, .NET EF does make it really simple, but since we have our data project completely separate from our web project, um, it's going to make sense to wrap all of these commands that we need to execute in this migrations, uh, this make migrations command. And you'll see how we actually make use of this injected variable mname here when we make our first migration. After we make our migrations, um, all that's going to do is actually create those migrations files and do some consistency check against our existing data in our database. Um, then we're going to run this db command, and it's going to be pretty similar um, with the exception of the .NET EF command. So we're going to say cd into goodbooks.data and .NET EF dash dash startup project. goodbooks.web. This is telling uh, Entity Framework to look for the startup project in our web project. And then the command is database update. And then finally, we'll cd up a directory again. OK. So if we have this make file, um, and maybe just for fun, um, if we uh, just, just so you can kind of see what's going on here, we'll make a, another entry here called hello. And I'll just echo hello out to the terminal here. So now if I run make hello, you can see that it's just going to say, hey, I'm going to echo hello. And then it actually executes that uh, command. And that's what we see on our terminal. So when I run make migrations, and I say mname equals initial migration, then what this is going to do is it's going to attempt to make a connection to that database and uh, name the migration initial migration. So let's just call it initial. Let's see if this works. We may need to make changes if anything is broken, but let's give it a shot. Okay, so that seemed to work. You'll notice that make is always going to, by default, print out 
um, the commands that it's executing and then you'll get the output to the terminal as if you had just typed this in yourself. So you can see already that that's kind of making our lives a little bit easier. If we head back into the application layer and in, then in the data project, we now have a migrations directory which contains a couple of new files. And so this is code that's generated by the framework to actually um, make those changes in our database. So you'll notice that it has these uh, create table methods that get executed with uh, table names. If you wanted to manually change these migration files, for instance, change the name of the primary keys that it's generating or the names of the um, tables, and you could do that here. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, you want to try to keep things as consistent as possible, otherwise uh, managing your migrations can end up being uh, kind of a nightmare. So what we'll run now is make db. And here we are getting um, an error and that's because I have a typo where I said .NET RF instead of EF. Let's fix that. And then let's run make DB again. Okay, so that's done. So what does that mean? That means that um, the Entity Framework was actually able to successfully execute that database migration against our actual Postgres database. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up uh, PG Admin 4, um, which again you can download, and this provides a GUI into our database. So let's take a look here at the various databases that we have. I'm going to go ahead and try to connect to a different database by adding a new server here, and we're going to connect to localhost with the username Good books and the password Emerson in this case. The name that we want to connect to is goodbooks.dev. So with that, let's go ahead and try to save. And let's try to open up this. We'll open up our databases. Um, we can see the various databases you might have running on your system here. I'm going to connect to goodbooks.dev, open up schemas, open up public, and then open up tables. And we can see um, a number of different tables here. First of all, all our books and book reviews tables. We can, re we can see the columns on those correspond to the properties on our models. And in fact, we also see this under double underscore EF migrations history table, which is what Entity Framework is going to use to track the migrations as they've been um, either rolled forward or back on our particular database. So in fact, if we wanted to run a basic uh, query, let's see if we can do that here. Uh, we need to right click on the public schema and open up query tool. And then let's just select star from books. And we have no records in the table, but we can successfully execute queries against that table. So we've had success now uh, running a database migration against the Postgres database using .NET Core. All right, so let's head back into our application layer. Uh, so one thing that I'd like to note here is that in, again, in, a, in an application that has any uh, actual substantial uh, complexity or uh, reuse, <laughs> then I would definitely recommend uh, separating out your data models, which you defined here, from uh, view models that you might use uh, from your service layer forward. So your web layer shouldn't really know anything about your data layer. Um, they're separated by the service layer in our architecture. So um, it's usually not really appropriate for controllers to pass back um, actual instances of data models to the view layer. Um, why is that the case? Well, there's a separation of concerns there. When we design the system, and we think in terms of entities, core uh, business entities in the system, uh, we're thinking about modeling in terms of data models. What is the state that we need to represent over time? Um, how can that state be synthesized to uh, essentially support the various features of our application? And the web layer is much more concerned with what are the, you know, what's the state that actually serves uh, the user so serves each view uh, in the end like at the uh, far end of um, all of the the logic being performed 
as a user, I need to see some information, and that may or may not, and often uh, doesn't necessarily correlate directly to uh, data models. Um, furthermore, the separation of concerns there allows us to um, ultimately not really reference the data layer from the web layer. Um, we really just want the web layer to be completely ignorant of um, you know, where the data is coming from. And so the service layer creates this sort of um, glue between the two, uh, the back end and the, and the front end of our application layer that says, all right, here is what you need. I've talked to the data layer. You don't need to know anything about what happened back there. Um, here is your view model that you can then just use as you need. Um, and then if we need to swap out the data layer, the, the web layer would be just completely unaffected. Um, because it doesn't, wouldn't need to depend on the specifics of what's happening in the data layer. So a long way of saying that what we're demonstrating here isn't necessarily best practice, and it would be something that you'd want to implement in a more full-featured version. Okay, so let's take a look back in our controllers. We have this book controller. How are we going to get access to our service, which can talk to our database? Well, let's head into our startup and if you recall, the comment at, top of, at the top of configure services here said this is where you can add services to the container. Here it's talking about the uh, DI container or the IOC container inversion of control container. And this is where we can use services to um, essentially map from interfaces that we request to implementations. And in this case, we're going to add transient instances of our services. Um, so of our iBook service, for instance, anytime I ask for a book service, um, please give me the implementation book service. So what does this add transient mean? Well, there's also add singleton, there's add scoped. This just has to do with the lifetime or the, the scope of a particular service instance. So add transient is going to say, hey, any time that you're making use of iBook service or an instance of a, a book service, um, just you know completely dispose of it um, between subsequent requests. If we were going to use an add scoped, this is going to be within the lifetime of an HTTP request or the uh, lifetime of the entire request. Um, add singleton will ensure that only one instance is ever used, um, which um, isn't what we want in this case. In this case, we just want a simple, stateless, um, very short-lived uh, instance of a book service when its behavior is requested. All right, and then a quick detour here. Inside of the configure method, what we're going to do is um, is ensure that we can make cross-origin requests. So our front end, when we build that in view, is going to be operating completely independently of our back end on a completely separate host. And so in order to wire that up correctly, we need to use cores. And um, by default, um, cores is disabled. But if we use cores in this fashion um, and specify that we want to allow any origin, any method, any header, that's essentially going to allow any service in the world to uh, make a request on our API. Now, our API is running on local host. Um, that's not necessarily a, a concern during development, but if you're deploying your app and it's accessible at some IP address, then this is gonna open you up to um, uh, potential dangers that can come with allowing cross-origin requests. So you don't necessarily want other apps uh, making requests to your API ar arbitrarily. Um, that's just uh, taking on a lot of unnecessary risk. And instead, you can actually just specify a specific origins, um, which you would want to allow, um, make a request on your API. 